Hello everybody, thank you very much for coming. My name is Randall Hunt. I'm a developer evangelist here at Amazon. Uh, I am sorry the session's starting a little bit late. I, my calendar is still in the Eastern time zone, so if I sound out of breath, it's because I just ran here uh, from another place. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about how you can take your existing infrastructure, whether it's in the cloud already, uh, but not AWS, uh, or on-premise, and you're going to be able to take that infrastructure and in a sort of defined way be able to move it into the AWS infrastructure. And maybe you have to do this in a hybrid approach, maybe you have to do this as a forklift approach. We're going to talk about all of that. But first, I'd like to introduce Eugene from BuzzFeed, and he's going to tell you a story about why being in the cloud is good. Uh, and with that, I'm going to let him take it away. Hi, I'm Eugene Ventimiglia, uh, Director of Technical Operations for BuzzFeed. Um, if you're not familiar with BuzzFeed, BuzzFeed is a, a news, and, um, news and cats aggregator, basically. Um, uh, we're an entertainment website. Um, right now, we get about 200 million unique viewers uh, a month. Uh, what I'm here to tell you is that one time, BuzzFeed almost broke, uh, but didn't. Um, let me give you a little, little background of, of BuzzFeed. Um, as far as how we've been growing um, and the challenges we faced up to this point. Starting out in 2006, um, we were basically a link aggregator. We were looking at what other people were sharing, and we were spending time um, building algorithms around deciding when things were about to go viral. And we did this process for a few years um, until about 2008, where we started generating more and more original content. Uh, we started tracking views. Um, in 2008, we were getting 2 million unique uh, visitors per month. Um, interesting link in there is Miley Cyrus. Uh, wet t-shirt pictures came out, which got 11,000 clicks. Um, right now, 11,000 clicks we get in about 15 minutes. Uh, but in 2008, it was, it was days worth of activity. Um, growing from 2009, 2010, 2011, where our story starts in 2012, we're getting serious. Uh, we have paid advertisers on the site. We have a news vertical. We have uh, style, life, lifestyle, food sections. Uh, we started an LGBT editorial section. We started sports. Basically, here's where we were when we went down. Um, here's where we are today, about 150 million uniques. Actually, this past month was um, over 200 million unique visitors. Um, we, started out, we started out looking at um, things as they were becoming viral and, and soon realized that we could make things viral. And this is one of the earliest uh, examples of that. This is a girl uh, who we dubbed Disaster Girl, standing in front of a fire, peering at the, at, the, um, at the camera, sort of a little guilty, smirkish way. And she sort of became the mascot of disaster at BuzzFeed. Right now, if you go to our 404 page or if you, you know, type a weird URL into BuzzFeed, Disaster Girl will show up on the site along with the error message. Um, People took Disaster Girl and remixed her into other disasters like uh, Monica Lewinsky scandal, um, <laughs> OJ trying on the gloves. Uh, I, I don't know what Brittany was doing here. Um, and these are a little closer to home. Um, these are not BuzzFeed originated, but other people took this image and started doing image, image macros out of them. Uh, you're going to have a bad time there. And this is my personal favorite, uh, worked in dev ops problem now. Right? Um, <laughs> has nothing to do with this, but, um, but this is what Basset Hounds look like when they run, which I'm really proud of also. Um, so, so basically what BuzzFeed is as software is a content management system. Um, what you're looking at right now is our home page. As you scroll down the page, uh, on the left-hand side is a list of what we call B pages. These are the actual article pages. And the th columns to the right of it are pages that are more static. Um, they're not generated. The, the content in those sections are not generated on the fly. Um, which means that they're cacheable. We started caching on Akamai early on the areas that are happening on the right and then the center columns, but the left-hand side, as, in, as new um, articles are published, has to be updated much more frequently. The other side of this, which most people don't see as a, as a viewer of BuzzFeed, is how, um, how posts happen on BuzzFeed. So this is the entirety of the software is the inputting of the posts and the outputting of the posts. Um, this is just an example of how, how posts are made, but this is either Users from outside BuzzFeed are contributing their own posts or, um, 
or our own editors are using this exact same software. I have to wait for this image to upload because it's really cool. Wait, hold on. Boom, all right. So um, this is a, 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 a unconventional network diagram of how this works. Um, you, you'll see on the left-hand side is HA proxy. Um, this is before Hurricane Sandy happened. This is how we were working in physical hardware. Um, we're at a data center in downtown Manhattan. We were using two, two and a half racks at the time. So we had multiple HA proxy servers. If you're not familiar with HA proxy, it's basically just a web proxy. It does a few more bells and whistles than that. Um, requests come in, and it has a, a, a series of uh, a list of servers that it can send the request to. So the request will come in to the HA proxy server um, into a, a pool of web servers. I'm only showing two because I don't want to be too specific about it, but it's, it, I mean, you know, one to, one to N, right? So multiple web servers. Um, as the web server gets a request for a page, uh, it could be that that page is a very popular page and has been generated already. So all the requests that come into the web layer checks with a cache layer. Uh, we're using memcache, uh, pretty vanilla configuration for that. So from the web server, they check in the cache servers. If the cache server doesn't have the page or the cache server has an old page, um, it'll then make requests to something we call the terminal server. In the very beginnings, uh, it was terminal like the, like the Bloomberg terminal where people would input the stories into the terminal. Um, so basically, it's a page generation server. Pages take a long time to generate compared to how quickly we want to show them, so we try to do that as infrequently as possible. The, um, what's, what's shown there is a terminal HA proxy, so that's a load balancer for our page generation layer. The multiple terminal machines will then gather the the specifics of the story from uh, MySQL and pump it into the cache server, and then the, the page will be delivered from the cache server. In addition to all that, and where the, the bread and butter happens, is collecting data. So as somebody shares a post with you, um, there are a, a multitude of, of servers out there that are collecting pixel tracks that result in this page, and they track, among other things, where you got the page from, which is an important thing for us when we're talking about uh, sharing being uh, kind of the, the bread and butter of, of our, cousin, our company. <laughs> what you'll see in red there is the growth of an article. Uh, this was, uh, excuse me, 23 Snapchats from toddlers. The blue uh, area shows times where we showed it on buzzfeed.com, and the red area is where above and beyond that people are getting to the site from elsewhere. So they found the link on buzzfeed or their friend shared it on Twitter. Uh, the network for this has always been um, dependent on uh, Amazon. So this was BuzzFeed's initial entry into using cloud-based machines was with this infrastructure. The pixel trackers along the top, these are very simple Nginx servers that log every request for pixel. Um, those logs are rolled up very, very frequently um, and delivered. I say rolled up, they are put into time buckets and they're delivered to a server which collates all that data and then puts it into a MongoDB cluster. Um, along with the roll-up, we keep the raw click data in a gigantic S3 bucket, really, really unwieldy bucket. Um, you, you cannot LS that bucket at all. Um, but someday we were going to do some sort of uh, data processing on it. I believe the data science team uses it currently to run Hadoop jobs on historical data. Um, from the MongoDB cluster, um, it, it generates the, the graphs and the charts that you're seeing over here. Um, so let me just take you back to um, two years ago, October 30th, was when this whole story happens and how we wound up migrating to Amazon. Um, so uh, Hurricane Sandy was blowing into town. Um, we knew this early on, and we decided to take our system administrators and spread them geographically uh, apart from one another and apart from where we realized that the most of the damage was going to happen. So. Um, one system administrator in Brooklyn, uh, multiple in Brooklyn, a uh, few in New Jersey. Uh, we actually contemplated going into a conference room in the data center because the data center is on the 25th floor of a building and we figured it won't, it won't get flooded. Um, I, I found out when I gave this as a test that the image on the right is not an actual. It's from uh, um, day after tomorrow. Thank you. It's from <laughs> uh, but this actually was kind of a hoax image that went around during Hurricane Sandy, like, oh my god, look at pictures of, of, uh, of the Statue of Liberty. Uh, so this was a day that I was working at home, and I, I, I woke up around, um, around 
eight o'clock in the morning and started, started working and um, basically spent the whole day um, at the keyboard until about uh, seven o'clock at night when I knocked off uh, for dinner. I sat down and immediately I got a call from the president of the company. So this is the very first thing that we did wrong. Our monitoring system, which was Nagios, was in the data center that went down. So when it went down, so did any possibility of it communicating back to us that it was actually down. Um, so you never, ever, ever want to get a call from the president of your company that your website is down. Um, pretty bad. So we immediately got onto Skype, which we were using at the time. Uh, we, we, had a, uh, we had an open channel for what we called you know, the war room. Every time a Nagios alert was coming off, we would all jump into there and say, I'm on it, or I know what this is, or what the heck is this? Um, in, in this case, it was, what the heck is this? Um, so the three people in the chat here are talking about trying to figure out exactly what's going on. So we're taking it from a network perspective where we're pinging and trace routing, and we're realizing that we're really far away from our servers, uh, from, from Brooklyn and from New York and from uh, New Jersey. We're trace routing in, and we're got, not getting, we're getting like three or four hops away from where we should be. So we're imagining this is big. Um, and uh, furthermore, the data center itself had its phone system in its data center. So when you called up the, the you would call up the, the, um, the support line, nobody was answering the phone, it wasn't going to voicemail, it wasn't forwarding to a pager or a representative because their whole system was down. And we thought we were gonna be okay because in addition to caching pages, uh, caching static content and caching infrequently changing content, we also cache every single page in Akamai. Um, Akamai, if you're not familiar, is a very large CDN. Every piece of BuzzFeed content is cached, cached in Akamai for only 10 seconds, but it basically, because of the nature of the traffic that we get, um, we get tons and tons and tons of viral traffic, but it might be for only a handful of posts. Usually 50% of our traffic will come from five or six statically generated pages. So that 10 seconds of caching saves us. What we had done is changed the failure mode for Akamai so that when our servers replied that the page couldn't be generated, Akamai would serve the stale page. So we thought we were okay because as long as it was a frequently accessed page, Akamai would have a copy of it and it would just serve out the stale one. What we didn't realize was that Akamai was taking 30 seconds to determine that our servers weren't responding. So 30 seconds in, in the internet is, is um, it's an eternity. People pick up the phone and dial, start getting mad after 30 seconds, but 30 seconds is as good as dead. Um, so we realized that we were down. We had no way to figure out how to get back up. Um, our editor-in-chief, Ben Smith, decided to start posting on Tumblr, um, which was kind of like a uh, kick in the pants for us because Tumblr was literally down the street from us, uh, but their data center was, was very dry. These posts that were going up here, it was a huge, huge, huge news day for us. Uh, Left-hand side was the FDR drive completely flooded out. The image in the middle is a, an underground parking garage uh, which had flooded and cars are floating out uh, of the parking garage. On the very right is a cat. Um, and like I said, we're, we're about news and cats, right? We, and we also, we figured out at some point that people come to us during disasters and it was a surprise to us. Um, and and uh, let me just toot my own horn so much, but uh, we couldn't figure it out, and what we figured out was that people want some, when there's craziness going on, there were some people that are like, I want to know what's going on, and there's other people that were like, I want to get away from this craziness. So the cat on the right is a way, you know, sort of to get away from the craziness. So meanwhile, if you look at the timeline there, we're down for an hour. So during this hour, the sysadmins are, are, are going nuts. And when I say sysadmins, it was me and one other person at the time, plus the CTO. Uh, we had a, a, the head of product who was also helping out, very familiar with the code. We started to assess what we had and, and what we were able to get if, if indeed this data center was not gonna come back in any reasonable time. Um, and here's, a, here's what we had. Um, we had a database copy, which is a snapshot, point in time snapshot, and the most recent one was done at 6.30 p.m. and that was at a disaster recovery site in Connecticut. Um, we really, really, really were close to not having that site. It was just, it happened to be that we got it worked out right before this happened. Um, our code was not a problem because we'd used Git. Um, our Git repo was in the data center, it was down, it was not externally hosted, but every working directory in Git is a complete copy of the repo. So since they had done deploys earlier in the day, 
they had tagged deploy of exactly the version of the code that was on buzzfeed.com, sitting on the CTO's laptop, sitting on the product designer's laptop. Basically, anyone who had pulled that day had a complete copy of it. We had no web servers, no cache servers, no terminal servers, like I mentioned before, but we knew how to use ET2, and we knew how to use Puppet. Um, Puppet has since been replaced by Chef. I'm agnostic about this, but you need configuration management for situations like this. Um, when everything is crazy, you're not going to remember all the little tweaks you did on every configuration file. But with Puppet repo also being in Git, being on my laptop, which I was able to deploy to a new EC2 server, uh, we were able to turn up new machines uh, relatively quickly. That analytics data that we were capturing uh, after it had been rolled up and put onto the MongoDB servers, the MongoDB servers were on the 25th floor of the flooded data center in downtown Manhattan with no electricity, uh, no light, no way to get to them. It was basically that analytics data that had been compiled was completely unavailable to us, so we're just gonna have to do without it for now. So we had to prioritize what part of the site we were gonna bring up uh, at what point. But new, new analytic data, once we got back up and running, all that was out on Amazon. There was a limited amount of it that would be in the collection machine themselves and would stay in those machines until we could, could work it out. Um, at some point in this hour, uh, a neighbor behind my house had a tree that was leaning towards it um, for years, and we've been complaining to this neighbor that really we need to do something about the tree, and the tree came down and, and hit our house. And um, in that same chat that I was in before, my uh, lead sysadmin, who is like a lot younger and smarter and faster than anyone else who was actually working on this, uh, basically said, my car's floating down the street, gotta go. And then I'm completely out of power, no electricity, and, uh, I'm gonna try to drive to Brooklyn. So uh, it was just me and the other um, slightly older CTO that were working on this stuff. Uh, we got confirmation between the CTOs of our data center and my CTO had each other's cell phone messages and uh, this is a, a reenactment of what happened. Um, basically he told us that we should, we should act as if, um, as, if, as if the data center was not gonna come back in any reasonable amount of time. Um, so, starting slightly before we had complete confirmation, but I'm gonna outline um, basically how we rebuilt the whole thing in the cloud um, that night. Um, we had no familiarity with RDS at the time, so we grabbed the largest thing that we could possibly get, the, and basically, judging by how expensive it was, we, we spun up the most expensive and largest thing that we possibly could. Um, well. I mean, th this is like a, a truism no matter where you are. Nobody is going to be mad if you spend a lot of money in a situation like this. So, like, having a problem that you can throw money at is a great problem to have because they'll find money and they'll, um, you know, they'll, they'll be appreciative. Um, so, we, the really, really, really simple recovery of this data, um, we basically ran MySQL dump because that's the tool that we knew how to use. Um, we pointed it at, at the Connecticut Data Center and we dumped it into a gigantic file. It really wasn't one giant SQL file that I put up there. Um, we realized early on that we were gonna have a problem and it was gonna fail halfway through and we have to rerun it, so we actually ran it on, um, we split it into separate, um, separate tables, like one table per file, and some of the larger databases we split into multiple, multiple files per table, so in an attempt to reload them. Um, which is basically this. We piped all those files back into MySQL and pointed them at the RDS instance. Um, that's all we knew how to do at the time, but it's just a MySQL instance, so it was really, really super simple. We did this in as parallel a way as we could, um, like literally using iTerm, opening up separate tabs, and each one of them is piping in, and we go check the, the yeah. Um, it's desperate measures, definitely. Um, so, once the data had, was loaded, um, and this is, this is like, I can't even fathom how long that process took, but it was definitely overnight. Um, we started to create read replicas off of it, which if you've created MySQL slaves before, you can really appreciate how simple a read replica is because um, I've been adminning MySQL servers probably since 98 or so, and I still have the dog-eared page on how to make a slave because it's a multi-step process. You're gonna make a mistake. It's just kind of 
it, it, it's, it's one of those things that it's hairy, and sometimes you've, you've, you know, you get the pointers wrong and you've got to redo it. In, in uh, AWS, it's basically click it, say, hey, I'd like a read replica, and, and, you, and you get one. Um, so for, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm missing a slide there. The other thing that we, we, we did, it's not noted here. We changed it to a multi-AZ um, instance, uh, which we didn't know that there was such a thing as a multi-AZ instance until we started this. We started doing a little research and said we should have made it a multi-AZ. What multi-AZ means is you have now a multi-master, which is way harder than this, just a master-slave relationship to do. But it, again, it's, it's a few clicks uh, on Amazon. For those web servers, um, we spun up a single EC2 instance. We had a decent idea because some of our staging was running on AWS at the time about how big uh, we wanted this to be. So we spun up, a, I think there was some sort of medium instance. Um, we built the very first one, and then we ran Puppet on it. Um, this step did not go nearly as easily as it looks over here, but it, it relatively easy. So basically, a Puppet was set up to configure the physical machines. We had now moved into Amazon. A bunch of things that, you know, like private IP address, a LAN, which we didn't have once we moved into here, had to be rejiggered out of our out of our uh, puppet configs, but we were doing all this testing on a single machine because um, after spinning up the single machine, we were going to go uh, replicate it across. Um, after configuring this one machine, we deployed to it with Git, which I mentioned to you before, which was really just as simple as checking out a tag um, on, that, on that single server. We have a deploy process for multiple servers, but in this case, it was just, let's make it work on one. Uh, immediately after that, we are saying create image, use the AMI, launch a bunch of these, basically. Um, in the data center, we went down with four, four hardware, uh, you know, four physical web servers, four physical terminal servers. We brought up uh, three virtual web servers, three virtual term servers. Uh, the idea being it might not be the right size, but at any point we could just add to what we had put out there. Um, the other missing part of that was HA proxy, which uh, we had done a bit of customization. I mean, for instance, some of the rewrite rules were happening on the, uh, at the proxy, so we had to move those rewrite rules back into the web. But aside from that, ELB works very much like um, the abstract notion of a load balancer. You basically say, here's the traffic you want in, um, and here's the servers we want to handle it. The cache layer. Um, is really too simple. Uh, spin up high memory EC2 instances, apt get install memcache, and that's it. Basically, all you, all you need is, uh, is that, point the web servers at it. So here's what the new um, arrangement looks like once we're on the web. Um, on the left-hand side, you have ELB, where we had had multiple HA proxy instances. Connected to the ELB are the instances that we're using for our web layer. Uh, we're pointing it to the we're pointing each of those at the EC2-based cache layer. We're pointing the EC2 webs at the terminal layer so that they can regenerate pages that are not in the cache. Um, and th each of those term layers are pointed to a, for reading, they're pointed to RDS replicas. And for writing, they're pointed to the RDS master. Um, this, this process we figured out somewhere around in the first hour what we were going to do. But um, this was like a long overnight session for me. So I have no idea what happened between like 9.30 and 8 o'clock. Um, I definitely fell asleep on my keyboard, um, and I had to Skype little you know, noise things so that I would wake up, and my boss woke me up multiple times. Uh, so, but, but sometime around 8 a.m., we actually were serving pages, which, uh, which is, is really what we were going for. Um, we still weren't able to publish, uh, but, but shortly thereafter, we were able to start publishing, at which point I, I, I pretty much passed out. Um, the only remaining bit were, were those servers that were on the top of the data center, and uh, we had these young developers that had just started with us. Uh, that's, that's one of them named, named uh, Andrew. Uh, he basically, we said, we need to go to a deserted part of uh, Manhattan. Uh, we're not sure if we're allowed to go there, and uh, basically, uh, there's no lights on the streets or anything like that. And he lived in Williamsburg, so he put on this hydration pack and a little headlight and ran to to Water Street and, and up, up uh, 25 flights and grabbed our servers and brought them back down. We brought those through the offsite. Um, cool thing, if you work for a media business, is that we can cover, uh, we can cover the situation happening however we want. So um, uh, Matt Buchanan was our tech editor at the time. Uh, he said, you know, we, we did it by using the cloud. Um, 
so this is a, a Wired magazine article where um, I was woken up by our PR rep uh, in the middle of the night and he said, can I get a picture of you? And I, I thought I was still like delusional, so I went back to sleep and then I woke up again and I was like, no, we really want a picture of you. So I friended her on Facebook and she found this picture, um, basically. Um, anyway, <laughs> so if, if this were to happen again today, um, learning what we had learned, we knew now that a snapshot in time database was not, not sufficient. So uh, we now have slaves, MySQL slaves, full-blown up to the second slaves out in a disaster recovery area. Uh, right now we have one in Minneapolis, we have one on an, we have one in a physical Minneapolis, we have one virtually in the West Coast, we have two in Newark, we have one in New York. We're very, very protective of that data. Um, the web servers we shouldn't have had to rebuild from scratch. We should have had a production ready server they were always deploying to um, in multiple regions and multiple physical areas. And the third thing is that we really, really should have been testing this all along, um, these scenarios, because we were, we're feeling more, more safe than, than we should have been feeling, and I think we, we still had that startup mentality where you build everything as fast as possible and it might break, but that's okay. Well, it wasn't okay by the time we broke, because we had, you know, we're making money, people were depending on it at that point. So the only thing I would have done differently is um, I would have come up with a better um, headshot because um, uh, she, she cropped it out of this picture. <laughs> this is like a personal hero of mine, uh, 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 Takeru Kobayashi, right? Um, a hot dog eating champion of, of the world. Sorry, I had to clear that slide before he took a picture of it. Uh, <laughs> you want to reach out to me, my contact information is over there, and Randall's going to tell you all the things I did wrong. Wasn't that awesome? Uh, so BuzzFeed, for those of you who have never seen it before, I don't know where you've been on the internet, but you gotta check it out. I, I look at it every day, and I mean, you probably see it in your news feed and everything like that. So uh, briefly before the session ends, I want to cover how you can do this in a non-emergency situation. Uh, BuzzFeed actually did very well, given the constraints they were working with. Uh, and you, hopefully, are not going to be in the middle of a hurricane trying to move to the cloud. How many people here, and I'm sorry to encourage audience participation, uh, but marketing requires this. Uh, <laughs> how many people here are already using some of AWS? All right, so no, no need for this session. Thanks. Uh, and then how many people have nothing at all in AWS? All right, see me after. So my advice is very simple. Migrate in phases. Uh, and this doesn't necessarily mean that the physical migration happens in phases. The physical migration could be all at once. You, you plan for downtime, something like that. But you want to have logical phases. The first phase is the assessment. Is the cloud right for you? Is AWS right for you? The second phase is the proof of concept. And the proof of concept and the assessment phase are directly tied to each other. That's going to be a cycle that you go through over and over and over again. And then you're going to have the data migration phase and then the application migration phase. And the application migration phase can be as simple as just a DNS cutover, right? You can say, hey, this CNAME is now this, and then within six minutes you're serving your new application that's hosted in the cloud. And you keep the other infrastructure up for a while just in case something goes wrong. And then the final phase is actually optimizing for being in AWS, for being in the cloud. And that phase is very important because you save money. So when we talk about assessment, one of the things we always try and hit on is cost. But it's not just about you know, the financial side of things. It's, it's also about security and compliance. At Amazon, we have a ton of different compliances. We have a lot of different uh, case studies and white papers on how you can process payments, on how you can you know, have DOD, CSM level one and two certifications, uh, HIPAA compliant, all of, all of these different things that different enterprises and industries need. We have that available and we have customers who have already done it, most likely. So you can go and you can grab this and you can find out how they did it and then you can do it yourself. Uh, and then you have your technical assessment. How exactly is this going to be deployed? Uh, and the key thing for the technical assessment is to run it like a science experiment, right? You start off, you have your success metrics, your idea of how you want things to perform. You, you lay that out on the table, and then you begin trying to meet those metrics in your proof of concept. 
And like I said, it's about more than total cost of ownership, right? Because you want to use the cloud for things that you couldn't use a traditional data center for. You couldn't use a traditional hardware procurement scenario for, right? What's going to happen? I just realized these slides are just not the right aspect ratio. I apologize. There's, there's been other cool stuff on the bottom about Twitter. Anyway, never mind. Um, so what's going to happen is you will have uh, a dramatically better experience as a developer and as an organization when you throw every single developer that works for your company IAM credentials and allow them to spin up an instance whenever they want to run any experiment they want. When you lower the cost of experimentation to virtually nothing and you have no capital expenditure to just try something, to try some new experiment, uh, you will be amazed at the products that people produce. Uh, you, you, we have seen whole new businesses launched within very established enterprises solely from this model. So it is not just about TCO. It's actually about enabling innovation. Uh, and you know, on-premise is very expensive. So there's less innovation, because every time you want to do something new, you have to do this incredible upfront investment. Uh, so we have all of this financial data, uh, which, as an engineer, I get kind of bored talking about. So I'm only going to do like two more slides on that. If you are interested in it, check it out, amazon.com slash economics with AWS in the subdomain. Um, so, and I know I'm, I'm running a little bit low on time here, so I'm going to keep clicking through to... So Condé Nast is one of our customers, and they had an incredible reduction in price by migrating to uh, AWS. Uh, and they have petabytes, hundreds of databases, lots of mission-critical applications like HR and finance and payments and things like that. Uh, sorry to carry on compliance. Sorry, I'm just having to get through this a little bit quickly. Uh, Dow Jones is another example of a customer that had a really great experience migrating. They actually did their migration in six weeks. So they, they planned this for a year, and then they did the actual migration portion of it over a six-week period. And they had back-out plans. You know, they had a, a whole scenario planned where they would be able to back out if something went wrong. And that's something that you should consider as well. Have an exit strategy. Don't blindly migrate to the cloud just because we shout at you that it's the greatest thing in the world. You, you have to have an exit strategy uh, because you know, some law could get passed in Germany tomorrow that says AWS is evil. And you, you don't want to be in a situation where you suddenly lose all of your German customer base. Um, but that's not actually going to happen, so don't worry. Um, if you have Oracle license, you have micro, Microsoft licenses, things like that, you can just bring those with you to the cloud. We have models that allow you to do that. Um, and then Dow Jones cited that they had a 30% increase in development velocity, which I honestly don't know what that means. But it sounds cool. So uh, when you go into the technical uh, assessment, there are two things that are very important. What are your latency requirements? What are your bandwidth requirements? What can we reuse? Make sure you have some sort of infrastructure as code, right? You want Chef, you want Puppet, Ansible, SolidStack, OpsWorks, wh whatever it is, make sure you have something that has your infrastructure as code. And if you disagree with this point, then you have never been in a situation where you needed this, OK? N your servers are not pets. They are not something that you take care of and manually log into. If you are manually SSHing into a server, you are living in the 20th century, OK? Servers are cattle. They die, they live at the whim of the internet. You need to be prepared for that reality, because that is where everything is moving. So I know that's kind of strong language, but treat your servers like cattle. Like cattle. Do not treat them like pets. Uh, and then you have the proof of concept phase. What you're going to do, you're going to learn the tools. You're going to sort of build a, a, a non-production minimum viable product. And when I say learn the tools, I mean People on your development team, not just the ops guys, should know about the command line tools, about the APIs, the console. They should be familiar with these things. And everybody should be able to experiment with it. Our identity access management system, IAM, allows you to log in, uh, even if you're a developer, and, and spin up and do resources. Uh, and then what you do is you take that MVP and you move it into production. Uh, and that, from an organizational standpoint, is going to identify a lot of hiccups, right? If you have legal issues, if you have overall cultural issues where people are not big fans of cloud infrastructure. You're going to be able to overcome those with your proof of concept so that when you have to do this in a real way, uh, you just sweep all that aside. Uh, and this is supposed to be really pretty, but PowerPoint. Uh, next, you have the data migration. 
And the data migration should always happen before the application migration. Uh, and I say that there is one caveat where if you identify that your data is the lowest hanging fruit in your application stack, then, uh, sorry, if you identify that your application servers are the lowest hanging fruit in your application stack and infrastructure, then it may be relevant and a good idea to migrate first your application. But typically, the data is the lowest hanging fruit. If you draw out a dependency graph of how things work, the data is the easiest thing to move. Uh, so we have a lot of things. We have a lot of services. Uh, I know you guys saw Aurora got launched this morning. Uh, I'm pretty excited about that. But we have S3. We have ephemeral storage on instances. We have Elastic Blog Store. We have Glacier for archival storage. And we have Elastic Cache for just-in-time storage. S3 has CloudFront. And we also have RDS. Uh, and we also have Dynamo for sort of a, a NoSQL-esque, excuse me, NoSQL-esque uh, database access. The other thing to be aware of is the import and export service. So if I were to ask you to rank things in terms of latency, and I were to say electromagnetic signals and Volkswagen, which one do you think wins? Electromagnetic signals win. Now, if I were to ask you to, to rank those in terms of bandwidth, which one do you think wins? Currently, the Volkswagen wins, because you can put more hard drives in a Volkswagen and drive it across the state faster than you can send that amount of data over a wire. Uh, and so that's what our import export service is. You can ship us hard drives, and we will put it into the data center for you. Uh, so there's a really great uh, talk from Midwest.io where somebody actually did this experiment. They took the exact same data, they shoved it all into a Volkswagen, and then they drove it across country, and they were able to move, I think it was like 14 petabytes via, via uh, Volkswagen fashion, they were able to move it over the global internet, just because of the fact that we only have so much capacity in, in the electromagnetic spectrum to you know, shove stuff over the internet. So keep that in mind if you have a ton of data. Uh, and then we have the application migration. And this comes in sort of two strategies. The first is the uh, forkless strategy, which I am hereby naming the BuzzFeed strategy. You move everything all at once, uh, and it's best for sort of low latency archival systems. So things that you need to be in the same place. So let's say you have your application stack, and then you have your, 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 uh, your database needs to be right next to it, or your cache needs to be right next to it. These are the things that you want to forklift migrate. Then you have hybrid things, so things that migrate much more slowly, uh, and maybe they permanently exist in two different places. So that's good for things that don't depend on this extremely low latency. Uh, and the final thing to do is to optimize for the cloud. And I'm actually going to skip a few slides here just so we have some time. Um, so in order to optimize for the cloud, treat your servers like cattle and use spot instances. Spot instances, for those of you who are not aware, is a market where you can bid on unused capacity, and you just get a server. And that, to me, is fascinating. Uh, that's all I'm going to say for now. If you guys have any questions, definitely come meet me out in the hall. Uh, I hope you guys enjoy the talk. <laughs>